bhakti, you know, I'll just use that word, and bhakti is really about devotion. It's actually about participation. Its translation is participation. Mm. And when I first heard that om, it just was an om, and it just rippled, and it felt like, what? We have this too? Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome to this week's edition of the Stay Human podcast, as always presented by the mighty, mighty Gibson Guitars. Uh, Man, Gibson has been doing incredible guitars since the first electric guitar, basically, the Les Paul. Um, Go check out their incredible Gibson garage in Nashville if you're ever there. It's like a hands-on museum. You get to play all the instruments and just experience the history of, of the first mandolins and guitars all the way up through um, where they are today. It's a a really a great journey. And I'm excited right now because I'm out here at Soul Shine Bali and uh, this guest on the show today is coming out here in a couple weeks and has been here several times. And uh, the borders are just about to open up so we can't wait to to welcome her onto these shores. And uh, she has immersed herself into the ancient practices of yoga for over 30 years. And she shares her teachings from the heart, creating a unique approach to living yoga through curiosity, through devotion, and through dedication. And she offers classes globally that challenge her students to investigate what they think they know, uh, to hold compassion for what they discover within themselves and to remember presence and to be present. And the long view and the radical depth of our interconnectedness. So please welcome to the podcast, Janet Stone. How you doing, Janet? I'm doing so well. So nice to be with you. I'm really excited to see you out in Bali. I'm really excited to uh, rejoin Soulshine as well. Well, the last time I saw you, I think, was at, uh, on the ocean at Soul Shine at Sea, which was, for me, it was just a really incredible experience. What was it like for you? Absolutely. Honestly, you know, with, with some trepidation, of course, just around, you know, what's a cruise? What's that all about? You're pretty much just kind of locked into the space. I met so many open-spirited, wide-eyed, big-hearted beings ready to celebrate, ready to uh, also just practice and take a, up some healthy choices in their life too, and dance, dance to the beautiful music. So, and wow, the view. It was it's crazy. Something. And, you know, I feel one of the things that makes you really special and great as a teacher is your ability to be welcoming and meeting people where they are with their practice and with their body, you know, like you said on the cruise, you know, there's a lot of people there who maybe had never been on a map before ever or were intimidated by it all the way through people who spent decades, you know, practicing. And yet you have this way of really bringing people in to make them feel comfortable. And I'm just wondering, where did you start off? Like, how was your how did this become your mission to be that kind of a, a teacher who embraces uh, people of just where they're at? Yeah, wow, that's a good one right there in the sense that where do you trace that thread? How do you trace that thread to sort of what that is? And I think I could kind of go all the way back to my family and my family yeah, uh, in particular my grandfather was uh, born and raised in India with three generations they were doctors and in service of um, the farm workers there actually so a lot of suffering and a lot of beauty and a lot of culture um, really just sort of imbued to him and then that came back to the California shores um, I arrived on this planet and he was around fortunately and so I was able to really uh, receive these amazing heroes stories, you know, of his and also mythology, so much of the mythology. And I was so grateful to receive it at such a young age. And then I witnessed my parents in the hippie era, but really choosing to live off the land more than just pure Mm -hmm. counterculture, uh, just more like, oh, these are our resources. So in my tiny, tiny, tiny little home, not much money, we just had rescuing snakes and rescuing uh, (laughs) raccoons. We'd have just like a big litter of squirrels and we would be nursing them to raise and release them. Deer, pelican, like the the strangest animals. Where did you grow up? 
East Bay, uh, San Francisco, California. Yeah, wow. just this little tiny plot of land. They just made it their own little heaven. We eventually went up to Oregon and continued on um, and had more land. They just got more land. But yeah, always had rabbits and pets and just, you know, cuddling with every sheep and goats and I milk goats and carded wool and spun wool and made stuff and churned butter, hand churned, cranked wheat. You know, we really, they really wanted to just be like, this is what it takes to eat and to live. Yeah. And I think that Somewhere in there, maybe it's that time with the animals, maybe just the way in which they exuded compassion, even amidst trying to live amongst normalcy, really, mm. you know, everyone getting stuff. They weren't really into getting things and having a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe somewhere in there, just what it takes to just feed yourself, what it takes to be here. Yeah. So did your parents work full time, just like farming? Was that their occupation? And or did they have jobs outside of that too? Or Yeah, my dad went and got a job at IBM. So <laughs> we needed Good some funds to, to, to take care <laughs> to take care of um, all of my mom's rescue animals. So yeah. yeah, it's like where we had this little adobe pool, you know, those little poles you put in and we were like, Yeah, this is so great. And then the next thing we know, my mom rescued uh, a bunch of koi fish that, you know, some restaurant that was closing down. And so, you know, my dad had to fund that somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so what did your dad do at IBM? Oh my goodness. He began uh, fixing copiers, which is basically where they were at that point. Oh, you know, they just yeah. had copiers and typewriters and, you know, sort of head in the machine. And then as computers started to, to go, he didn't, he got brain cancer really young at 43 mm -hmm. and passed away at 45. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so he was with IBM all the way through till the end, and we had one of their first little computers in our house too. Mm. You know, with the little orange things and that tiny screen and the big giant. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. awesome. <laughs> How old were you when he passed away? I was. They had me fairly young. I was twenty-one, so I really helped him. I was living, uh, moved in back in with my parents after I'd lived in Paris, and I moved back in with my parents and just basically. My mom worked nights. I was in school and working days and then just took mm. care of him in between. So more just about the human experience and about yeah. sort of what is that when the body goes and the will is still there. So strong to live, to be present. There's so much vibrancy. I mean, just one of the most beautiful human beings and just watching the process, the trajectory that that the being goes through on the way yeah. out when it's a short lived journey. Were you there in the moment when he actually passed away? I was. What was that like for you? Oh, yeah, just getting goosebumps all over. Obviously, it was a long time ago. It was incredibly beautiful, honestly. It was yeah. painful and also incredibly beautiful to witness his last words being like, I love you, you know, and just then that, that exhale, that. Mm -hmm. it, that exhale is just like there's nothing like that last exhale where yeah. you just watch like oh and you know I was never you know believing in what's next but you know just that feeling of the essence of a being moving out of its of their body and done and so how precious it is to have all of this yeah that's a lot of living for a young age. I mean, to think of all that you uh, experienced up until the point where you're 21 and, you know, living off the land and taking care of uh, other beings. And what role was, was school and sort of, you know, teenage, you know, <clears throat> puberty like, like what, what, what was that era like for you? Were you, did you go to a normal Ooh. school or? <laughs> that's all that is so good that is when the script flipped at that, yeah. at that moment for, <laughs> for sure <all> <laughs> it's like <laughs> everything leading up and you know just all the work in the garden and you could just see how successful it was and there had been quite a bit more loss in my life prior to that so it had just been a lot you know there was there was a lot I'd seen a lot and I think right at that moment we were in Oregon at that time and um, my mom wanted more bigger garden more animals you know, milk machines, you know, horses now. And we were just like, F you, peace out. 
hire somebody. We're not your labor anymore. And of course, we just, I mean, love the animals. We're so, you know, uh, wrapped up in it. And right around then, they they probably very wisely chose to um, move to Colorado. But I had um, really found my place through professional dancing. I'd been dancing since I was a kid mm-hmm. and movement. And that was where um, my life really found itself in this new iteration that I was becoming was through Mm -hmm. dance. And I danced for a company in Oregon and Portland. And uh, just the vitality and the separation that you need, you know, and yeah, high school was was high school, I was thriving when we were there. Then they left and I had I followed after we were done with a particular dance tour. And I followed and went to Colorado in um, my middle of my sophomore year. I think Mm -hmm. in high school. So imagine that, right? So you're 15 or 16 and ripped away from like, I love there and you know, everything. I had had the same thing happen to me at that age. It was was the worst. It's the worst. And also then you look back and it's so defining, right? You look back and you're like, yeah, I would not be me without, without that. Yeah. So, so it was very painful at the time. And it was, again, a big middle finger to the parents. And, and yet, you know, I ended up just really finding a whole new layer of myself, Boulder, Colorado. I mean, it's mm-hmm. beautiful. And, awesome. you know, through some time, uh, yeah, never really interested in high school again after that. I kind of just hung way back. Just kind of got through. Yeah, I got through, moved to Paris the day I graduated and yeah, then came back and went to see you at the University of Colorado. What was your draw to Paris? What was that about? Oh, I was a lifeguard in um, Boulder for many summers, uh, amongst other jobs. I also worked on the ambulance and I was also hired to the circus. You know, I had all these interesting, weird, strange jobs that I did. But one <laughs> of them was being a lifeguard at the Boulder Res. It was like the place. And yeah, yeah some two French guys came out one day and we were just chatting and there's the little accents. And uh, the next thing I know, I just was like, oh, that's where I want to go. I want to go there. Yeah. And I decided basically that day and yeah just to really put myself in an awkward position which yeah. worked out did you speak like french it. at the time nope. before you left so you nope. just you just got on a plane went over the and did you link up with those guys or was you, did you just find your own way there or what was the connection i did for the first couple of days and realized the circumstance was not what one was you know told to me previous yeah. to getting there and so yeah, yeah just or you just Figure that it out. really, yeah, helped me figure out how to figure it out. Yeah. And what did you learn from that sort of freestyleness? Yeah, I learned that there's a lot of different humans doing a lot of different things and really trying their best to get through this wild trip, you know? And mm. I think at one time I ended up living with someone from Cote d'Ivoire, this girl, and mm-hmm. and then her friends were over, but they were really into something, some substances, and the boys were about to be transcripted, I guess. Uh, they had to do two years in the military, but then they wanted to overdose so that they didn't have to go. So anyway, I saw a lot and yeah. then just made my way in and through the world through a lot of different life and adventures. And I think my passion for m- more passion for art and literature and the streets and early in the morning and late at night and just, yeah, wandering in curiosity, I guess. Mm. So then you came back and your father passed away. And after that, what, what was the next step for you in your, in your journey? Yeah, there was a bit of caring for my mom after not, uh, there was a lot of caring for my mom after that. She was young and um, so I supported, but then I just had to get out. I had to do something different. I felt very like, okay, let me help you get things in order. And then I, I just blasted off to Los Angeles. I moved right into basically Malibu Canyon. My yeah. sister was out there and got a job within two weeks at a, at a film company that did documentaries and ran a nonprofit for uh, kids who were getting out of what they called camp, Camp Gonzalez and yeah. basically youth prisons, uh, and helping them, supporting them transition back into their life and mm-hmm. really trying to support them to not repeat and how painfully difficult 
that is. But yeah. so I worked for them both in the nonprofit and the film. And the films really were documentaries about their lives and doing these various different tactics, like, yeah, trying to um, understand and show people like the human experience of not having a father, or, you know, broken homes and access and lack of access. Mm -hmm. When did you first get on a yoga mat? Mm. Well, let's talk about a cushion, I guess, first, because okay. that's actually preceded all of that. The cushion okay. came first. I met my first teacher when I was 17, so pre most of this. Yeah. And his name, he went by, everyone called him Miraji, and his name's Premarwat, but they call him Miraji. And there was a big culture around going and listening to Miraji speak, and he would travel around and big crowds or you'd go and just with people and watch one of the videos and then talk after like if he's if he's in Australia or if he's over there and then you'd listen to it and his teachings were just about um yeah the awe and wonder and joy of life of just being like what where we get lost in our heads so I guess that happened around 17 um and then really started practicing his meditation he gave me sort of the techniques when I was 22 I think. Mm -hmm. And so I hadn't touched a mat, <laughs> just a cushion. And yeah. then I was, went deeper into the film industry, was at Castle Rock Entertainment. I was racing mountain bikes and surfing and just doing all these fun adventure sporty things, tons of snowboarding. And then I blasted off around the globe alone with my backpack for a year and a half and India was it was on my radar and so I went to India and it was really there that I found oh there's movement that goes with this sitting part yeah oh look at that and so and it wasn't really so official it was um the Shivananda tradition that I met some people in and I would follow them and we would do stuff. And then we'd go up to Nepal and I'd meet a whole other crew up there, but wherever I went, everyone was doing asana. And yeah. so I just was doing asana. And what did you get from it? What was the, what was the draw? You know, I remember the first time when I went, when I went into a yoga class, I was incredibly stressed out. It was it was September twelfth, two thousand one. So it was the the day after nine eleven, and um, you know I was concerned about everything that's happening in the world, and and I went in there and did everything the teacher said, and I was super stiff, super tight from just being on tour, not really taking care of my body, not eating well, you know, partying way too much, never sleeping, and I walked out of there and I felt just different. I felt like that I, and I cried like a lot over what was going on with, with nine 11. And, and then next day I was like, I want more of that. Like I, whatever this is, I, I want more of it because I feel different in my body and I feel like this sense of ease and this sense of healing. And, um, that started my journey for me. And, you know, everywhere I'd go, I just go to a different yoga class in every city that I was in. And it's still that same sense of wonder, you know, today that I have, you know, it, it, it goes up and downs in terms of that sense of wonder. Some days I'm like, oh, I just got to get on the mat because I got to get on the mat just because I know it's the right thing to do. But by the end of it, I always feel that sense of, wow, something did transform me. Something moved. What was it for you that kept you going back? Yeah, I think it just made sense. It made sense in my whole being. It was an integration, I guess, of all the movements and uh, then the intensity of feeling and emotions and trying to digest and make sense of it all. You know, the, the amount of loss and then you're traveling and the amount of suffering and then the amount of money in this one place, but then none over there. And then, mm -hmm. you know, um, and somehow the movement helped me integrate what I was working with in my mind, right? Mm. And my body loves movement and same washes of emotion with no name. Like you don't need a name. I don't need a reason, just full emotive experiences just because, you know, it's like what we store in our body is truly 
um, can be healed through these practices. So I have so many people say to me, oh, yeah, I'm so stiff. I can't do yoga. And I was like, uh, you're so stiff. So yoga is for you. That's why you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I'm it's so actually, sick. I don't want to go to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. It's for you. And this is, it's for every body, every being. And yeah. I just couldn't believe that it would fit every form. It was really the art and science of it. The more I dove in, and that's the thing that's kept me 30 plus years. I don't even want to count the numbers. It's just, it's always something more. Same with you. I sometimes I feel like a 14 year old, like F yoga, it's not doing, you know, and then other times I'm back in love with it. It's, it's, it's like a long-term relationship yeah. and always though, there's something in there. There's something new that I, it's like, oh, because my body and being is changing every day and yoga is always has a way to find. Yeah. Right. You know, I remember the first time when I came to one of your classes and, uh, I, forget, I guess it might have been in Shavasana, and I were, you know, my eyes are closed, and and all of a sudden, the, I hear this music come over the 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 PA, the, the the sound system, and and then I looked up, and it was you singing. I was like, "Damn, I thought this is a record." <laughs> like, uh, I was just yeah. really like, "Wow, she's such a great teacher." But you, but music is a huge part of who you are, and you have an incredible voice. Talk to me about how you dis you talked about you know the discovery of your body but tell me about the discovery of your voice and the role music plays in your teaching mm, yeah so i've got the harmonium right, right here right next to me so it's it's never far bhakti you know i'll just use that word and bhakti is really about devotion it's actually about participation its translation is participation mm. and when i first heard that om it just was an om and it just rippled and it felt like oh right my cells were reorganized not in a woo woo way but in a, like a really grounded yeah. deep rich like ah <gasps> what we have this too and just to note that a lot a lot of practices um spiritual but then also sort of um forms like aikido or the forms that we have right martial arts and such have are really about not you know refraining a lot of discipline which is super powerful and i use that in many ways but bhakti is like bring your poison like bring your greed, your fear, your jealousy, your grief, uh, your ugly bits, your beautiful bits, bring it. And, and that, I mean, I don't know how to sing for the life of me, but I definitely know how to draw from the roots of all of it and let it move through me as best as possible. And then the more you stay, the more you learn, the deeper you go into, you know, the meanings of the things. But ultimately, if I go all the way back, it's just one big ohm that unites us all. It gets us out of the frontal lobe almost immediately, drops us back in our body. It also sends an immediate message to the vagal nerve, like you're safe. So the body begins to heal and regenerate and digest literally and figuratively. So yeah, why not? It's yeah. pretty amazing. And boy, it took a lot to sit there in a room with, I don't know how many hundred people and change. And I, for probably about 12 years, just a cappella. I would yeah. just sit there. Om Hari Om. I, you know, just here I go. And sometimes yeah. a voice would be quivering. Sometimes it would feel strong. Yeah. You know, one of my uh, favorite teachers, um, Sharon Gannon, I was at a workshop of hers and she said, how do you know when your practice has deepened, you know, and, you know, people shot their arms up. Well, you know, when I first started, I couldn't, you know, sit um, in a uh, lotus position and now I can, or I used to not be able to do a handstand. I can do a handstand. And her response was, um, you know, when your practice is deepened, when you can say what you mean and mean what you say. And you can say what you mean and mean what you say. And that's always been something that was really, uh, um, that has stayed with me and lived with me. And I'm always in my practice and in my life thinking, am I doing that? You know, whether it's like um, confronting a workmate about something that's we have to change or that's uncomfortable or 
um, that there's a disagreement or whether it's showing up for my wife, Sarah, in the ways that I want to be the best person. Am I, am I doing what I'm saying and am I living and breathing what I'm, what it is that, um, that I want to be living up to in my life? What, what comes to mind for you when you hear that? Yeah. It, it, what comes to mind is really living yoga. You know, I mean, the principles of yoga are laid out so crystal clear. It brings to mind self-awareness, which is svadhyaya, which is, you know, one of the niyamas, one of the principles. I don't want to go too far down those, but it's all laid out there. It's, it's really trying to align our, first of all, acknowledge and understand our deeper longing or intention for this life, this one short life we get, right? Mm -hmm. What's my, what's my deeper intention? It's going to change, but just keep coming back to like, what is that? And then how do I line up my day-to-day -day actions, my behaviors with that? When it's so easy to get pulled off and to get over there and ooh, stuff and uh, hurt feelings, old wounds, triggers, as we call them. But just this, um, this journey and practice, it is a practice of self-awareness. Like, oh, what is, what is it, what's actually up for me, right? And then responsibility, you know, taking full ownership of what's happening right here for me. Um, so it's, yeah, it's basically kind of lining up, not just all the movement and the great flexibility of body and strength and body. Um, but it's really just day-to-day -day choices. That's where it comes. That's where this practice comes most alive. Yeah. You know, during the pandemic, we've all had to find new ways of, of, uh, taking care of ourselves. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about mental health because there's so many of us who have, you know, battled depression, anxiety, insomnia. And I mean, there's nothing that could bring that on more than the state of the world that we're living in right now and multiply that with the pandemic. And uh, I was talking to a great artist yesterday, Milk, and just, just thinking like, uh, you know, a few years ago, she was performing at the Women's March and there was, you know, literally millions of people around the world breathing the same air together. And then suddenly we like, we couldn't do anything, couldn't be around anybody. And now we're like, and then we went through, continue to go through, you know, the, the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and now we're, feels like we're almost at the precipice of like World War III, just as we're hopefully coming out of this pandemic. How do you navigate all of this as both as a teacher, but how is it, how has it had to switch for you and change for you um, teaching online perhaps, or, or do, or being the work that you did that was so much about bringing groups of people together in the same space. And now we've got all the emotions X factored, but we can't be together in the same space. How, how has that been for you? Yeah, that's a lot, right? I mean, that's a lot to unpack in the sense, I mean, I definitely have mental health uh, issues in my family. I mean, pretty, pretty solid ones. And I've done a lot of work to really stay as grounded as possible. And yeah, for the first time in my life, I would say that I experienced anxiety and really low dips. And I, I can look, I can reflect now and go, good, because I had had all these mechanisms to not touch those spaces, all these mechanisms, right? And like you said, out in the world and bringing people together. I mean, it's, you know, a fraction of what you do, but just this big energy and all these. And so now here I am. <laughs> no, I have to just sit with myself and sit with the discomfort and sit with what are my management tools and what can I actually do to sit with these feelings? And then, yes, bringing people together. What was really I'm so grateful that it came clear to me almost immediately is that we have the minutia that's presence, right? This breath, that's what we pay attention to in yoga. We have sensation, body sensation, physical sensation, sensation. And then we have the vast view. We have like what we call the Shiva view or this view that we can look out and just go, Oh, these mythologies, these Puranas, these stories have been told lived time and memorial. And I realized, oh, my job is to support myself and people from presence and big story. And mm -hmm. all the stuff in the middle is drama. 
And there's always going to be drama and there's always going to be friction. We're always going to have that tension. It's just going to be that way. And where, where can I be super present and then also be able to expand out in wider views? And, and honestly, the deities and the stories of the deities are so helpful for me. I'm, I'm writing a, a book on, on these right now. They were told to me as children. I'm super into Joseph Campbell, The Hero's Journey. Uh, I wrote scripts in the film industry. So I kind of like this power of story, again, to drop back behind the frontal lobe. And so I just used any way that I could show up my humanness. Yeah. My humble humanness of being like, I'm here too. I'm stuck in here too. And, but I'm going to just show up. And it was really just about that. Let me just keep showing up, showing up, showing up, reminding of absolute presence. And then that vast view and knowing that always that tension in between and all that stuff in between is always going to be there. Yeah. Um, you know, as a parent, how do you talk to your child about, what's happening in the world today. And especially in the light of social media, I get this question all the time from parents and they're like, what can I say to my kid about social media? You know? And, um, it's a different time. I mean, you and I grew up about, we're, you know, close to the same age and we grew up at a time when, you know, like you said, you saw the first IBM computer and couldn't have even imagined (laughs) <laughs> you know, that we'd all be carrying around a supercomputer in our pocket and communicating with hundreds of thousands of people on a daily basis. Like, but how do you talk to your kids? Yeah, I've got, yeah, I've got two children and um, India just moved off to New York to study environmental policy, at the new school and um, is a they, them. And um, Liliana goes by Billy and, and she's still here with me at 15. Honestly, how I talk to them is listen. <laughs> like mm. They are brilliant and they are a new wave of being and their context is their current context. It's just, it is the current context, just like yeah. Taj will have a different context, even than my kids. And I could try to go, oh, but back when, and I'm like, but it's not back when, it's right here and right now. So how do I create space for them to be the healthiest, most grounded, and in any way they can come back toward their center. And so much of that is gifted from zero to three, honestly, that early childhood time. And then the rest is just like compassionate bumpers and uh, celebrations of lots of messes and mistakes and um, (laughs) sort of like, wow, that's happening now. Um, (laughs) So I don't know if I really answered that more than just like really listen they're so brave and intelligent and facing things I couldn't even fathom. That's awesome. I also have a non-binary child. How was that for you? Or, you know, what was your experience with that? Of them, them coming out to you or was it just something that was always there? Yeah, it's been a it's been a journey and a process, you know, from, you know, a sharing from around eighth grade, you know, around sexuality and then just this permission actually given through what's happening in the world and also so social media, you know, I feel like they both have access to it to understand like, oh, why do I feel different? And, oh, you know, and who knows what feeds what, but I think it was really just what letting them lead and then doing my best letting them lead really putting my own projection as often as possible aside and having to do my own internal work so that i can just be there and go yeah beautiful and i will slip up and i'm going to make mistakes and i'm going to call you my daughter i'm going to say she and i'm going to do those things and I, I'm just going to love you and do my very best. And you tell me what you need. Yeah. What's the, um, your mission? Like, you know, if you could distill it into, you know, a sentence or a phrase or a paragraph, like what is it that you want to do? What's your, what's your mission through the, your teaching, your practice, your life? Yeah. Fully authentically. And that's an overused word, but authentically, share the teachings that were offered to me to anyone and everyone and to allow people to feel seen and held as they are. Mm. 
just right. where they are. I feel you. Well, I think you do that. And I love your teaching. And I'm, I'm excited you're going to be coming back to do a retreat at Soulshine. And, um, you know, we've, we've missed you. <laughs> we were hoping it was going to happen a couple of years ago. But um, uh, it's, it is exciting to see the world evolving. You know, like I see just, you know, an awakening. I see people who are really paying attention to things that are happening in the world in ways that they never had before. And as a, as a musician, as an artist, that was always one of my goals was, was to try to like shine a light on issues or on groups of people who have been marginalized or on things that don't always get seen in the mainstream. And, and now we see that a lot more ever than before. And, um, what's something that you're, you've learned during the last, like, um, you know, a couple of years that you're like, you know, I'm, I'm ready to let go of this. This is not serving mm. us, me or us or the world anymore. And, and then what's, something that you're look, really looking forward to as the world comes out of, you know, hopefully comes out of this pandemic. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. I think the busyness, I think the busyness, I am, I'm, I've just really, even. Me too. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just kind of like, <laughs> yeah, you just kind of keep questioning and it's like, oh, let, let that maybe just flow on, you know, it's so easy to kind of grab on and just go, oh, but. Uh, and especially if you have a message, right? And you really want to share that message. Yeah, so I think just just that busyness and, and really attention to um, my choicefulness around what I say yes to. And then also letting go a little bit of that um, say, trying to save the planet. I mean, I am going to still do all of that, but it it will... Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a something, there's a cost to all of that. Yeah. And I was starting to pay that physically, emotionally, mentally. And I think doing my very best to hold up the people and offer what it is that I do for a living. I've created wellness programs for like the Natural Resource Defense Council, trying to support Sea Legacy. I don't know if you know Paul Nicklin. Those guys are absolutely amazing. Just the places where I can Right. Yeah. And I can with ease and grace and, and potency. So not sort of splaying yeah. any of it out too much. Just like, oh. yeah, rooting it back in. So it's, I would say that, I mean, we've, we, fortunately we created an online platform far before this, about eight years before this. So I was so fortunate to have that going already. And so that share and that way of, of moving these teachings out. So if you're in Korea, I get people from there, from South Africa, wherever you are, that you have access to these teachings. Yes, I'd love to be in person, but I also can't be just like you can. It's just like, yeah. great. They get to listen to your music anytime, yeah. you know, so. You know, it's what you said is really um, one of the things that was a big awakening for me, just that busyness and um, and also taking a step back from some things to in order to be more effective in other places and in 1994 i actually wrote a song that was about that and it was called water pistol man and it was like if i have the power of a water pistol am i more effective trying to put out the fire of the entire earth that's burning or am i more effective at watering the flowers in my own backyard and mm. like the answer that that came up for me during the pandemic is like kind of like both it's like when we all get together and collectively squirt our little squirts of water, like we can yeah. do big things. And we've seen that during the past few years of just like mass movements of people saying yes and showing up to, um, for social justice, for the environment, for, you know, the anti-war effort, you know, um, and we, you know, when you do that a lot, you, you run out of water. And you go back to your house and you're like, man, I was totally not showing up for my kids the way I could have been. I wasn't showing up for my health. I wasn't showing up for my, my partner. And that has been a big lesson for me this last couple of years of really like taking a step back from some of the social justice things, like not feeling like I have to, like it's my responsibility to comment on every single meme that gets posted. It's like, yeah. I, I spend, I'm spending hours and hours of time stressing and, and, and worrying and did I write the right thing or whatever, rather than like, Taj, let's go like throw a ball. 
you know, yeah. sorry, let's go for a walk or like, let's go pick tomatoes. They're ripe, you know, things that uh, were always about the, you know, big letter P politics and not about like just the connection of how people connect with, with one another. And, and that's really been, um, I think the biggest lesson for me and the thing that I'm really working in my music and writing about now, it's like, how do we share? How do we connect in ways that even though we're doing it through zoom, you know, I, I, I um, when my father passed away this last year, our, we had a zoom memorial and, at first I was really bummed out about it. You know, I was really like, man, this sucks. I like, like we, I can't travel. We can't be, we can't all be together. But the quality of connection that we had on that zoom and the conversations, the way people were spread, expressing each other to each other um, was in some ways more intimate, more real, more raw than when we're in person, you know? And that was another big learning for me is just because we got to be physically distant doesn't mean that we got to be emotionally or spiritually or musically or soulfully distant. How has it been for you, you know, really, you know, as you, you like you described, describe kind of stepping back from some of these other things and trying to focus more on what you can be effective at? I mean, in a personal way. Yeah, for sure. I think it, I mean, it comes down to that individual sustainability. And that's yeah. what it's going to take for everyone to understand that it's not out there. Yeah. And I think when you do have a message and you do have a gift and you have a passion, you're like, oh, but I must, <laughs> you know, uh, what would Beyonce do is always my quote, you know, <laughs> 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 but she's chilled out as well. So no, but it's, it's sustainability. Like how is yeah. this, this physical system doing mental, emotional, physical system doing yeah. How can I just, you know, how can you just keep hopping time zones and keep going and kids here and organizing all the things and one on your back and one on your front and go there and be there and because you want to share, yeah. you know, but the sustainability, I mean, that goes for anybody in, in their work world and their work life and their live, if they live their passion as well, you know, either way, when you punch in, punch out, it's like, how can I take care of this internal system? Because then guess what? You'll use less. You'll just yeah. actually naturally use less. Yeah. And um, you actually save your resources and you can replenish your resources and let them actually be longer. Not that long life is a thing, but just quality of life, right? That mm -hmm. it's, you just feel more quality. Like you said, when you have a giggle with Taj or even when he's having a tantrum, you know, when my teenager is being super teenagery or we're just sitting there rapping about something, just just covering the coolest topics that I never even could have imagined because I'm here. I also, you know, had a chance to have a relationship, which I really just haven't had. So I, and then fill out the online programs and make another album and, you know, just do fun th work on my book. And mm. yeah, so I think it's like, oh, it's not like a, all these things are going to fall away. I'm going to sit around and do nothing. I get to love. I get to laugh i get to actually have spaces in between yeah. get to feel not bored but just kind of like oh nice awesome but, yeah i got one last question for you which is uh, the question i ask everybody on the show which is how do you stay human and what does it mean for you to be human and how do you hold on to it Ooh, yeah how does one stay human is accepting the human experience to me being really humbled by every single breath and and in that empathy. So I'm empathy. And so it's somewhere between gratitude and empathy. <laughs> and because you see, you, you're just in, if you're in that gratitude, you're sort of in awe that you get another breath, that your heart is still pumping, that your lungs are doing their thing. And after these couple of years, you know, we know how precious all these systems are, you know, and my mind is functioning. So I stay human by embracing the human journey, that there's highs and lows that I'll forget, that I attempt to remember. Um, there's love and loss and winning and losing along the path. And I just want to walk with you and walk with everybody on this really human journey. Jen, it's been awesome having you on the podcast, just to hear your story and learn more about who you are and the mission that you do. And uh, if folks want to know about your 
uh, everything that you're doing from retreats to your online to your daily classes, where is the best place that they can find it? Uh, JanetStoneYoga.com or on the gram, Janet Stone Yoga. It's really easy to find me. Just send a message, say, hey, I'm really excited to come out to Soul Shine too. Really. Nice. We can't wait to have you here. Uh, on behalf of everybody who puts this show on, we just want to say thank you to Gibson Guitars. And we'll see you next week on the Stay Human Podcast. <laughs>